From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. We are returning to an ongoing series about mysterious inventors and scientists. You can check out part one of Mysterious Inventors, released on December 20th, 2023, as the humans reckon the calendar. Do you guys remember that one? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it also echoes back to uh, an earlier episode we did, Who's Killing All These Scientists? Which is about assassinations of, uh, like, open secret assassinations of scientists who are experts in nuclear weaponry. Like defenestrations, right? People getting tossed out of windows. Some of that, yeah, right? But but ultimately, that one, gosh, it came out in 2014, you guys. Uh, that was when... In 2012, there were some big stories coming out about Iranian scientists being murdered, like straight up car bombs, Mm -hmm. uh, 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 explosives attached to a motorcycle, all kinds of craziness. Yeah. And in each of those cases, of course, there's no real like international uh, justice regime that is trying to, you know, advocate for a prosecution. And there are a lot of dangerous third story windows, depending upon which parts of the world you move in. Whoops. Mm-hmm. Slipped on a banana peel. Um, yeah, but it's also like hard to, to um, get motive quickly or intent, you know I mean? If, like, unless you're abs- absolutely like in on the conspiracy, like who do you report this to? And how do you go about reporting it? And like, what clues are you looking for? It's tough. I mean, maybe I'm just being, maybe that's just a lazy way of thinking of it, but it does seem like it would be difficult to figure this stuff out, you know, with any kind of immediacy. That's good. Uh, For the nuclear scientists, we know they were, they were the victims of targeted killings entirely because of their work uh, leading current non-nuclear nations to nuclear weaponry. But in the point you raise, which is mission critical for tonight's conversation, we're seeing we're seeing a bit of human psychology as well. Let's say somebody is working on something controversial, right? Non-nuclear related, something bad happens to them. Are we to say that they were uh, the victims of a conspiracy or were they the victims of the dark lottery that is accidental death, right? You, we, we can't say everybody is killed because of their hobbies or their career. Well, there are also examples that we've come across over the years where it is a prominent scientist, let's say a Russian scientist who was on the team that brought Sputnik Mm five into being the vaccination against the COVID-19 virus Mm -hmm. vaccination that was approved before the final trials were done. Right. And then he ends up dying and like, let's say strangled in his own apartment with a belt, um, which is, this is an actual example. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody like that dies uh, is it because there was some kind of interpersonal con- conflict that is what is alleged to have happened, or is it something bigger? And how the heck do you prove it? Well, and, and I guess with when in cases like that where there's a suicide, perhaps there are boilerplate kind of procedures that go into clearing it, making it you know okay, was there foul play? Was there evidence that somebody was here and, and participated in making this happen, or was this just somebody that took their own life? So, but beyond that. It's hard to, you know, it's hard to push for like more taking a closer look unless there's like a very clear pattern. And so tonight we're exploring stories about scientists allegedly or in some cases provably removed uh, to not to not because they were bad people, but in a larger effort to remove their expertise from the grand chessboard of Zbigniew Brzezinski. We're zooming in on these scientists. Let's give a bit of background. Here are 
the facts. Uh, you know, if you listen to part one, we don't have to spend too, too much time on this invention. It's amazing. It's such a superpower. Uh, the animals of the world have it, not just humans. Otters make tools, corvids make tools, cetaceans as well. Like animals get the idea of invention. And it's really helpful for the human experiment because it, uh, an invention addresses problems that human beings cannot solve with their starting operating equipment. Like, you know, you, you start with the body and the mind. You can't automatically make fire unless you figure out a couple of other things. Yeah, I think the big difference with humans is we figured out, like you said, uh, power, a, a fire, right, as the first thing, and then combustion, and then electricity. And once you once you have power tools, right, if the beavers have power tools, oh, look out, buddy. Sorry, forests. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, that is where... That is where I think humanity becomes dangerous to itself and any of those other animals that might figure out some tool making. Yeah. Has humanity broken the game of evolution? That's part of the question. I mean, look, also we're talking about discoveries and inventions, discoveries and inventions. They're closely related. They are kissing cousins, but they're not quite the same. A discovery may simply be an observation. The in idea of an invention is the application of a discovery. So it leverages what could be an abstract observation into technology. Like a great example of this comes from the Nolan film, Oppenheimer, spends a great deal of time on the difference between discovery and invention, theory and application. Multiple points in that um, film adaptation of, Op of Oppenheimer's life, we see the legendary physicist Oppenheimer saying, I am a theorist. I'm not actually making the thing. I just... I understand the mechanics of how it would work, and that's why he needed a team. Well, someone can discover a thing and not have the skill set with which to apply it practically, right? Well, yeah, exactly. The discovery that, oh, there are atoms, and this is how we think they probably work. And as you said, Ben, the technology, or, or even the theory is, maybe someone could split that atom. Mm -hmm. it, could it happen, it's, right? It's possible. Then, right? You, then you invent the thing that could possibly split the atom, then you discover again, it mm -hmm. can be split. <laughs> and then you parlay that into world destroying weaponry, you know, and, and then a blockbuster Hollywood film hey. on, on the backs of millions of deaths and on the backs of Barbies. Uh, the, yeah. The world. I, uh, my theory is that movie would not have done as well if there hadn't been the Barbenheimer phenomenon. It's such a, it's such a long thinky kind of movie. It's kind of wild that it did so much business. In the box office. I, I don't think know. I, I kind of fell in love when I saw it for the first you time. You really dug it? Yeah. Okay. I All thought right. Oppenheimer had a lot of poetry to it. Cool. I really, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I obviously, I was not able to make it uh, when we all, when you guys went uh, and saw the movie and I'm still have not seen it. So I look forward to catching it. It's cool. You about. should, you should watch it on an old school Nokia flip phone yeah. with mono sound the way Nolan yeah. intended. Letterbox. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, you know, just like in Hollywood brainstorming, a lot of inventors have ideas that don't lead anywhere for any number of reasons. A, a lot of times you're a scientist and you say, huh, that's interesting, but the concept is not immediately applicable nor successful because it needs other discoveries or inventions to render it feasible. There's an amazing sketch by the criminally underrated group Mitchell and Webb that talks about this. And they have like an old school, middle ages, Italian-esque inventor. And he comes up to the money guy and he's got a carved wooden mouse and it's got a little carved wooden ball inside of it. And the money guy is saying, okay, what is this next great invention? And, and the whole bit is, it's worth watching. The whole bit is the dude saying, well, I don't know exactly how this is going to matter later, but at some point, someone else will invent an amazing thing and you'll need this little carved mouse. And you can, you know, and he's like, okay, well, what does this mouse do? And he's like, well, you can click on it. And it doesn't have a bunch of wires leading out from it. And the money guy's like, yeah, but it's the Middle Ages. Most things don't have wires leading out of them. So, yeah. like, 
I think that's a beautiful way to show how weird invention is. Like Da Vinci but, and the flying machine. It's for clicking and dragging. Come well, on, cavemen. I think, we all, I think we all got it at some point, but let's make sure we all understand. It's a computer mouse. I had in my mind a tiny mouse like a, a creature mouse that had a ball inside of it somehow. And I was like, well, what is that, this thing I mean, we're discussing? Early, <laughs> uh, early prototypes for the mouse perhaps looked more mouse-like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, with uh, Da Vinci's fly machines, we got some amazing sketches. His head was in the right place. He was onto something, but it wasn't until centuries later that the Wright brothers made powered flight a reality. Also requisite shout out to Charles Chappelle. Uh, but Black but was his there. heart in the right place, Ben? That's what I want to know. Unclear. Okay, unclear. Unclear. Anatomically, probably. <laughs> Quite possible. Yes. Possibly. Yeah. So you can, you can also stumble across something useful while you're researching a flawed or dead end idea, right? Like, uh, like think of the alchemist. They're looking for the ability to transmute lead into gold using the philosopher's stone. They're questing after immortality. They discovered neither of those things, but they did invent pesticides along the way. So thanks for the roundup, uh, alchemist of old. Uh, and they also sort of stumbled into the discipline we call chemistry. And as you know, if you listen to Ridiculous History, a ton of inventors died at the hands of their own inventions or as a consequence of their discovery. Like everyone from the guy who made the creepy horse statue at Denver Airport to uh, Marie Curie and radiation poisoning. Well, yeah. And I mean, we know how hard it is sometimes to get things approved for clinical trials or studies or whatever, human testing. So a lot of times, you know, inventors who are on the verge of a breakthrough will be like, ah, we don't have time for that. I'll just test it on myself. Oops, I died. <laughs> right, right. And that's part, that's one of the darker sides too. You know, we mention this often because we cannot mention it enough. Uh, Suppression of technology might sound wackadoo, but it's very much a real thing. You might stumble into an amazing idea. You might win the lottery and purposely create an amazing idea. Your initial concept might be on the money, but there, if it challenges the status quo of a system, just like Copernicus, right, then you are going to be in trouble. Here in the U.S., we have the Invention Secrecy Act of 1951, anti-democratic, anti-free market, very real and top secret. That's interesting, Ben, that you liken it to things like Copernicus, which often studies or, or, or discoveries or, you know, individuals like that that have theories that sort of flew in the face of organized religion or like the governing status quo in terms of them holding on to power. I guess I think of the Invention Secrecy Act as being a little more like along the lines of like, you've discovered a thing that you shouldn't know about, that like we, it, it, it's ours already. You know what I mean? And if you put this out in the world, it's going to compromise national security. Which maybe yeah. is just a modern example, a, a modern version of that past, you know, threatening the religious status quo. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm overthinking this, but I think that's very interesting. Yeah, that's the comparison I'm hoping to draw here because the threat to the status quo, whether that is a secular state power or um, an ecclesiastical uh, theocratic power, it still has the monopoly over violence. Like if you, if you try to find the, you know, if you try to find a year by year spreadsheet or markup of uh, things that fell to the Invention Secrecy Act, then you're you're going to have at best mixed success. We know that there is a list of compensation. It's kind of like an eminent domain of ideas where they can say, hey, your idea is worth X amount of money. We're going to pay you for this. You can never talk about it again. If you do any further research on it, you automatically work for us. Democracy and the free market take a backseat every single moment to nation state concerns. I mean, you can invent anything you wish in the U.S. until the powers that be deem you a threat. And you might be saying, guys, it's 2024. Surely. We've evolved past burning scientists at the stake, right? We're past these barbaric acts. We just don't do it in public. Yeah. <laughs> we just don't do it in the town square. It's mm. a little more covert than that. And you'll see why we find this optimism a bit chuckle worthy after a word from our sponsors. 
Here's where it gets crazy. There are tons and tons of inventors and scientists whom, depending upon who you ask, uh, depending upon whom you ask, ran afoul of great powers. Remember we talked about Rudolf Diesel? What happened to that guy? Did he just did he just fall overboard? I don't know. I he still disappeared don't know. on a on a ship, on right? A ship. That's the yeah. During a night walk. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, well, people saw him go into his quarters and, and his, then his they clothes didn't. were folded. There was a watch like left on his nightstand, sort of. I, I believe it was just very much Betty by type activities, right? Yeah, but the big point is nobody saw him leave and nobody found his body if it, he was deceased. And he told people he would see them the next morning. It's sketch, guys. I mean, we, we, we've already talked about it, but it's, I, I would be hard-pressed to believe anything other than he was taken out. It's tough, right? Well, wait, really quick. What was the connection he was potentially going to sell his technology? Or but it was like a bad deal, too. Wasn't there, powers? There, there, there was some kind of weirdness about powers. Allied was, powers. Right. Got it. But, but wasn't there some kind of weirdness about the deal where it was like really... Was it really lucrative for him or was it kind of like him not getting dealt a good hand? It was it was something like in one extreme or the other. Like it was either a really good deal for him or a really bad deal for him. And he had money problems. He yeah, left two exactly. duffel bags, yeah. cash and mm-hmm. stuff with his wife. I, I mean, in each of he's a great example because in each of these following cases, we're going to see accusations of conspiracy. We're going to see a lot of skeptics who say, hey, their invention didn't work. It was pseudoscience. And then sometimes we're going to see a conspiracy blooming just because of what a person was doing before they died, like their career, their hobbies, their interests, whatever view you might take fellow conspiracy realists. We're going to see a lot of questions that remain unanswered. Maybe we start with uh, Dr. Rodney Marks. Shout out to uh, what happens when someone dies in Antarctica which I think has been yeah. on our minds recently. Oh yeah. Well, especially when someone dies and the death isn't even thought to be a homicide potentially, right? Mm-hmm. For a long time. Yeah. Let's let's learn a little bit more about Dr. Marx, huh? Absolutely. Dr. Rodney Marx was an Australian astrophysicist uh, who was employed by the Smithsonian Society. Um and he was a part of a research project in Antarctica for the National Science Foundation uh, at the time of his demise uh, on May the 12th of uh, the year 2000. Um, He was stationed uh, at one of these research facilities. Guys, sorry, I'm just getting mad True Detective vibes. Uh, This is such a, it's not, it's not, it's not Antarctica. It's uh, Alaska, but very much revolving around mysterious deaths at research stations in uh, the frozen tundra. Um, The station in question here was called called Amundsen Scott Station in the South Pole. Uh, And upon his uh, expiration, his uh, his cadaver was flown off of the continent immediately over to New Zealand. Well, let's go ahead and say he didn't have, like, gunshot wounds, right? It wasn't, like, one of those things where, oh, this is a homicide, we need to get this guy out. Or this person is um, not doing well we need to save him and and get him out of here he is dead and he is sent somewhere right and it wasn't cyanide to the good people of thailand uh yeah he had uh i love the setup there he had because his condition deteriorated incredibly quickly precipitously he was he was fine one day as fine as one can be living in that harsh contained environment and then the day before he dies, May 11th, he is incredibly unwell. He's vomiting blood, like starts mon- morning fine. By the afternoon, he's vomiting blood uh, and he dies. Investigators were not able to, or still not able to fully figure out what happened because the body, to your point, Noel, was moved so quickly. Uh, they they did conclude in an autopsy that he died of what's called acute methanol poisoning, No one who was around, and there's a very small group of people here, just like the board game Clue, no one has come forward to explain exactly how he ran into acute methanol poisoning. Investigators did rule out suicide. They said, we don't have any indications that this guy purposely consumed this lethal amount of methanol. But then the investigators also said they got stonewalled at every turn. So the alternative being that they were 
slowly fed the stuff or mm. it's no, or that it was just a, a hazard of the, of the, of like a occupational hazard. I think it, there was a significant amount of it that got into something he ingested at some point. So, which then, you know, if you're an investigator, you're trying to figure out, well, how did that methanol get in his system? Right. That's what Ben was saying. And the people who are around him at the time didn't seem to have much to say about what could have happened or what the, uh, how it got into his body. And methanol is related to alcohol, but it's it's not the alcohol you drink. It's kind of like uh, in Prohibition when uh, they the poisoned US government, it on purpose, right? When the U.S. government actively poisoned people during Prohibition. So the question is, yeah, did, did he get poisoned on purpose? Is this a homicide? And if so, why? And if you're an investigator asking that question, you have to wonder why the National Science Foundation is not helping you at all. That is a little odd. Also, the immediacy of the flying the cadaver off to New Zealand of all places is a little weird. And there's a there's a piece in the New Zealand Herald that it, gosh, it was from 2009. Mm-hmm. It talks about the well, at least it alleges, according to some internal documentation from the groups that were running the station out there, that there was heavy drug use on the station by personnel, heavy drinking. Uh, by the personnel at the station. And it does, I don't know, again, it it's weird because it leaves open the door to potential accidental poisoning. Right. Like he, because he was a binge drinker, had he accidentally consumed methanol, right? Uh, possibly while already inebriated. And that's from, uh, there's a, there's a, another, there, there was another update to that from Jared Booker. If we're talking about the same article, uh, where, 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 and they also point out he was one of 50 people on the site. There were, there were a lot of people there, uh, but they're all clearly identified. They're all clearly, if you were an investigator, you should be able to find and question them. And even the, even the assigned coroner out of New Zealand had a problem with this. He said, I don't think New Zealand police and authorities are being given the information they need. So no, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no shade on New Zealand, but why New Zealand? He's Australian. Was it just proximity? Like, I, I guess uh, I'm this is just w- this was an outfit reporting on it. Uh, it's David. It's by David Fisher, by the way. The no, article. They, oh, he's asking why he's they flew the body to New Zealand. For, oh yeah. Uh, apparently, I guess like what for them to do to, to investigate? Like who who on whose authority? I guess is my question. Right. Proximity would would be the answer there. Proximity and available investigative okay. Got facilities. Got yeah. It. But we, we also don't know what he was working on, which is the next question. No, we don't. Uh, just just part of the weird stuff here. And again, it, that's just why it's weird to me when you think about it as either a covered up homicide or an accidental homicide or a, accidental death. Right. Within a close knit organization like that. Uh, it was, it was stated, at least according to this article, it was stated that this should be investigated as a homicide immediately, like upon the body being found and then moved to New Zealand. They said the, the investigators said, Hey, this should be looked at as a homicide, the medical, um, examiner, but that was not, it was not treated that way. And the organization that was running the facility basically whether they whether they had anything to do with it, with it or not, people were able to go into his room and actually move things around, mm-hmm. get rid of evidence if they had wanted to, and everything was tainted. There was no way to prove what actually happened to him at that point. Potentially, yeah. And uh, police were still wondering whether there had been uh, U.S. agencies carrying out a full investigation and whether they in New Zealand would be able to have access to that investigation. At this point, it seems like the answer is not really. And if we were to say this was a case of conspiracy, then we ourselves would need much more information. Uh, we would need to know what exactly Marx was working on. The closest we can tell you is that he was running the Antarctic Submillimeter Telescope and Remote Observatory, or wait for it, Astro with a forward slash between the T and the R, which I think is just a very cool name. Mm-hmm. 
That's, I'm trying to keep it positive. Yeah, he's working for Harvard Smithsonian, but we we <laughs> we know the cause of death, but we don't know the um, the circumstances leading to it. the The crime scene, or if crime it is, is absolutely foobar. Uh, this is going to remain a mystery unless one of those 49 people comes forward with legitimate information. So, what do you guys think? Is it is it possible that he ran afoul of someone um it's just hard to say if like imagine you're in that isolated place you've got some kind of some kind of personal conflict with somebody else and it's only it's getting worse and worse because you're so isolated uh yet stuck together uh methanol poisoning would be a way to do it if you knew that the people or the person was around you that uh drank a lot or you could put it in, right, you could put it in a familiar container or something. We would just need to know more about how the, how meth, acute methanol poisoning works and what the time frame is. It's also possible that they, this person drank from the wrong container. It's also possible they were dosed in a way that didn't involve recreational alcohol consumption whatsoever. It's just tough, but we see again this thing we we're talking about earlier, which is the fact that this guy is a scientific luminary and the fact that his death is and probably will remain so mysterious naturally breeds speculation. It's a big problem. There were 49 other people at the station. Uh, right. Yeah. So like. That's a lot of suspects. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> what, what is that? Who's that? Um, the detective who's doing all the movies lately, like um, it's doing all the investigation. Oh, oh man. Why can't I think of this? The one about the glass onion. Oh, oh wow. uh, not Perot. No, um, it's like a, du- I can't du- remember du- his retrieved. name. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> played, it's played like by Daniel su- Craig. Yes. He's yeah. excellent. God, what a cool character. He's so funny. Just imagine that movie, except there are 49 suspects. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, and we are getting a message from Mission Control, Benoit Blanc. Oh, Benoit, Benoit Blanc. Blanc. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, let's move on to Dr. Don Craig Wiley. Uh, he had all the makings of a future Nobel Prize winner until his body was recovered from the Mississippi River on December 20th, 2001. Tennessee and Arkansas police forces, in collaboration, rule this death a homicide he is a uh, biophysics expert and uh, he had been missing for more than a month before his body was discovered yeah this is a weird case it's a really weird case um i think the biggest well i guess let's talk about it um because it's a bridge right that he must have gone over Right. But there's uh, this bridge allegedly or not allegedly, according to the investigation, was pretty protected from somebody going over that bridge unless they really wanted to. Yeah, it has a it has a two meter fence. That's like six and a half feet. Yeah. On, on either side, which is not easy to, to get over unless you want to. If you're somebody throwing a body or something, probably not going to happen. It's going to be a lot more difficult. Um it's just a weird place, especially after being like missing for so long. Yeah. And they found his car on that bridge. He had a rental car that they found on the bridge. Uh, also abandoned vehicles are going to play a big role in a future episode we're doing, but the FBI does become involved in this case. Uh, and controversially, they're the ones who say he had an accidental death. Somehow he stopped this rental car on this bridge, looked at the fence and said, challenge accepted and somehow fell over to his death. But there's another interesting thing here to this pattern we're establishing folks. His death comes in the wake of the anthrax scare in the United States. And according to his peers, he's one of the few people who would have been able to accurately trace where the anthrax had originated to find the provenance of the anthrax, which remains part of a heated debate and uh, conspiracy theories today in 2024. So your mind reels, right? Oh, wow. Was, did someone 
Did someone kidnap him and take him away? How did he get a hold of a rental car? It was 15 days, but like your, your brain, you want to go into investigative mode. At least I do. I know, I know I do. Um, who, who would have motivation to take him away from that? Do you think he would have motivation to want to escape himself, right? To disappear right. for a while because of whatever right. pressures he's getting. Um, there's so many different avenues that you could go down with him. Mm, yeah. I mean, it would have been convenient if we're playing the if then game. It would have been convenient to certain people if he were no longer a factor, but then we would also be assigning a lot of agency and ability to people who who would be able to track someone down if they're off the grid via uh, probably like credit slips, rental car stuff, whatever kind of technology. It just seems like it's asking a lot of that conspiracy, but it also is asking a lot. It's asking an almost equal amount to accept the FBI's official explanation. A guy stops his car, climbs over a fence, and drops to his death. Right by a hydroelectric plant, apparently. No, no indications of suicidal ideation, etc. Ah, feels like a dumping, like a body dumping to me, but a mm -hmm. difficult one somehow for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and spoiler, folks, we're not giving the, we don't have the answers for no. a lot of these. We want to hear from you at the end of the show. We have no idea. You, but just one last thing, Noel, before I just really quickly, um, I think there is potential for someone to have gotten to him before he disappeared, right? So, like, Ben, we were talking about, like, having to track him down with rental car stuff and, and credit slips. I think that there's potential that somebody got to him and then the disappearance occurred. Uh, right. Because he was with somebody, but that's just been held and mm -hmm. then transported, mm -hmm. perhaps, uh, perhaps put to the question, right? Yeah. I was going to ask if, if you guys thought there was any indication of like some mysterious third party, you know, like, uh, and I hear when I think of like dumping bodies, I'm like, well, you got to have help to do that. So little has been released. Yeah. Even now. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's tough. It, it, it is a good question, you know, because to, to approach an answer here, conspiratorial or mundane, we would need to know at least a little bit of what happened in that half month, in those 15 days, right? Is it possible, like when someone gets abducted, for example, if they're being interrogated, then the idea is you always want them to feel like they can escape the situation at some point, right? If they... If they pay obeisance and they comply, then maybe they'll get away with a few broken fingers or whatever. Uh, and we're not saying that happened here. Uh, we are saying that it is a very mysterious death, and you cannot blame friends and family for refusing to accept the FBI's explanation. Like that, you know, you you would need an accomplice or a, a perpetrator for a body to be thrown from a bridge, and if someone just decides to jump off of a bridge you would to make that story stick you would need to have some indications of their mental state up to that moment uh, and in both cases we simply don't have that information no it's a weird one. Oh yeah it is indeed and uh, i think we got got a couple other weird ones uh on our hands as well okay here's one uh to that point here's one that I'm a little skeptical about Eugene Malov, M-A-L-L-O-V-E. Uh, at the time of his death in May of 2004, he was a leading scientist in a, uh, being diplomatic here, a controversial concept, the field of free energy. Uh, he had been, I, I think his death, though, was probably unrelated to whatever his research was. I think it's, I'm like not a hundred percent, but it looks like it was just other bad actors being bad people. Yeah. Uh, again, it's a problem where if you are involved in something that sounds super cool and potentially dangerous, like free energy, right? Could you actually build something that would rival the big energy companies and would they want you dead because of that? E even if you're doing all that stuff, no matter how successful your inventions are and your pursuits are, you can still have problems with other individuals that enter your life that have nothing to do with your research, 
that uh, could cause your demise. I think this might be an example of that. I'm tempted to agree. Yeah, because like, uh, imagine when you hear what happened, folks, imagine if this guy had just been really into fly fishing. Imagine if instead of researching free energy, he was researching better ways to build uh, fishing lures. Okay. Okay. You, you know, so. And then hear this. <laughs> and then hear this. All right. So let your minds diverge. We're going multiversal. Uh, Malov's been renting out his former childhood home to a family. The name of the family is the Schaefer family. And later, the son of the Schaefer's, Chad, along with one of his friends, Mazelle Brown, and along with Chad's girlfriend, Candace Foster, they get charged with the scientist murder in May of 2004. Apparently, what happened, what occurred <laughs> was that these two guys, Brown, uh, Brown and Schaefer, Chad Schaefer, Mazelle Brown, they beat Dr. Malov to death, and they didn't do it because of problems with free energy, they did it because he was evicting Chad Schaefer's parents from that rented home uh, because they, they hadn't paid their rent in a couple of months. And you can see testimony with uh, Candace Foster. You can, you can see where these folks got booked. The investigation looks pretty solid. It, it still, it took, even then, no allegations of conspiracy. It took police years to make the connections and the arrest. Which seems insane. Malov uh, was there cleaning the home that night at like 11 p.m. at night, cleaning the home after the eviction, and police didn't think to imagine that those who had been evicted could have been a part of it? I, it does. It makes me wonder if even detectives can get taken down the wrong path when you introduce something like, oh, this guy was working on free energy. Mm. Oh, man. Right? I, I don't know. I just, How do you not make that connection almost immediately? Because they they would, th these are people who would, who would have the perception that they were victims of this guy, right? And despite whatever their actions were. Which makes you think too, you know, uh, how easily the course of an investigation may be altered because you're looking for anomalous, unusual things, things of note. Research into free energy is one of those things, more so than fly fishing, but you have to, you have to consider all of these aspects. So for those of us playing along at home, we have, we have uh, two cases where we can't say for sure what happened. We have one case where it does seem like, um, a tragedy, uh, an egregious, a, an egregious act of homicide, but not related to scientific pursuit. Do we want to take a break for a word from our sponsor? I have the feeling we got a couple more to get to here. Seems right. <laughs> And we have returned. Here is another death without an answer. What happened to the physicist and nuclear research scientist? We had to do at least one named John Mullen. Just one John or one? One, <laughs> one, one right. nuclear research scientist <laughs> named yeah, John I, Mullen. <laughs> named John Mullen. Mm -hmm. out, out of the very many, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, this, this case is who this one again, if you're just, I go so speculative on these and, and I play the, if then game, Ben, I think mm -hmm. to my own detriment here, but well, let's, let's just do the facts of this one. Dr. John Mullen died of arsenic poisoning. And according to authorities, it's believed that that poison f somehow found its way into a drink that he consumed and they could admit they made that connection. Um, and Initially, who did they think maybe was the culprit? Uh, yeah, his girlfriend at the time, his romantic partner, Tamara Rollo. Uh, this was also in 2004. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and they thought they thought that she would be the top person of interest. She was actually going to be arrested on suspicion of homicide. But then what happened? Mm, then she ends up dead. 
And then at the time, um, investigators on the case didn't really give up much information to the media um, as to whether or not she'd committed suicide or there had been some foul play suspected. Uh, There has, uh, at the time of this episode that we're recording right now, been no conclusive answers to these questions. So your primary suspect ends up dead. Mm -hmm. There's no trial. Isn't that convenient? I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm also also considering two weeks after the murder of Mullen, and they and they do conclude, by the way, investigators conclude that he was drinking he like he was a mineral water guy. So he drank some mineral water and it had been laced with a fatal dose of arsenic. Two weeks after the murder, his girlfriend, Rollo, who was 52 at the time, she leaves a message with one of Mullen's children, one of his two sons. And in the message, This is per Mullen's son. In the message, she says, quote, don't be surprised if you find my body floating in your dad's swimming pool. Wow. See, did he did did Dr. Mullen know something? And he even divulged to Tamara that he knew something as, uh, you know, connected to his contract with Boeing. But but just the fact that he did have a contract with Boeing, he's working on stuff that could be potentially highly Mm, secretive and dangerous sure. like sure. genuinely secretive secretive and dangerous compared to you know the free energy or something like that um i don't know i just thought that was interesting because it is convenient to have someone the main suspect die before there's any trial or discovery or anything like that mm-hmm. yeah the best way to keep a tomb secret is to kill the people who dig their grave you know, there you like, go. The, I mean, shout out Genghis Khan. But also, you know, if we were exercising skepticism, we can do a couple of counterpoints. One, Boeing has a lot of contract workers, uh, right? And uh, and two, is Boeing's does Boeing have the operational capability to execute a homicide? They just a punch clean a way? hole in a in a fuselage. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> So like the more conspiratorial thing would be he had some he had some disturbing whistleblower knowledge of some sort, whether that's yeah. crooked funding, whether that is poor engineering oversight, et cetera, and that he was silenced and that his girlfriend was silenced as a result. But again, no proof, no proof. And police did interview her before her death and they said she was talkative. She wasn't defensive. Um but I don't, I don't know. You know, later Rollo's daughter found a book under her mother's mattress that talks about how to kill people with poison. Most right. folks are sl- most folks are kind of sloppy on this stuff. Your uh, your your phone searches aren't secure, and honestly, a VPN is not going to help you. Just to be clear. You guys, I, I was, I've had a sick family for the last couple of weeks, so I've had a lot of opportunities to hang out at Walgreens, and I couldn't help but notice a giant display of, um, I guess it's like defrosting kind of fluid. It's that blue fluid that comes in the giant jugs, and there's massive warnings on the back about what happens if you ingest it. But my sick conspiracy brain immediately jumped to, man, what a way to get to someone who's a big fan of blue Powerade. Am I right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dogs love it, too, because it tastes sweet. It's sweet, apparently. And, and that's the problem, right? You could put it in Powerade, just not 100%. And if someone drinks that stuff five times a day, they'd probably never notice it if they didn't notice it had been tampered with. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, sorry. That's just, these are the kind, as Ben always says, we're fun at parties. Can we're fun I, at parties. <laughs> can I tell you guys? Okay, so I <laughs> I go through way too many cans. I'm a bad citizen of the All earth. Right. You recycle, though. You're not that bad. Come on. That, true, but, I, but I'm still, I think in the... In the end, I'm probably not a good. I'm not good to myself because of the stuff that's uh, on the insides of those cans and all the, the energy, we, everything oh, we've done, the PFAs, got yeah, it, got it, got it, got it, got it. all no, no. the stuff we talked, all the about. hits, all the good ones. And sometimes they don't get recycled depending on where I am and if I can gain access to a recycling bin or not. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I am so paranoid about the the click and the pop you get. If I open up a can and that's supposed to be carbonated and it doesn't have just the exact sound that I'm looking for, I dump that baby out. It doesn't I, pop right. 
Yeah. <laughs> didn't pop right. You really do that? Yes. Matt? You do? yes. Oh, wow. And, and it's not because I actually think anyone's trying to poison me or I, I think about the manufacturing process and I think about like a, f- a flaw that could have happened oh, in one that got so missed. many steps along the way where Ooh. things could go wrong. And I'm just yeah. like, I'm not going to take the risk. <laughs> well, guys, remember back in the day where it was so much easier to tamper with even like medicine and there were all these scares of like people like poisoning aspirin and stuff. And that was literally what led to like child safety caps and stuff like that. I mean, we're better than we used to be, but it is still kind of scary yeah both the good and bad actions of the world are easier than you think folks and that's something that should stick with all of us and speaking of questions that remain we've got a got a couple more examples for you as we said this is a continuing series because uh there are a lot out there do you guys remember the story of aaron salter jr this one I don't sort of know. Slightly rings a bell, but no, I, I don't think so either. No. So Aaron Salter Jr., like so many people in the United States, falls victim to a mass shooting. And oh. the frankly terrifying thing about the U.S. then as of now is uh, that is that mass shootings happen so often here, right? Uh, far more often than in many other countries. Aaron Salter Jr. is not an inventor by trade. Uh, He was a career police officer in Buffalo, and in his retirement, uh, he took a security guard job at a place called Tops Friendly Markets. He also picked up a hobby, which is one of his like primary drives at this point. He's working on an invention of fuel cars with water electrolysis. So he's making a water-powered car. Like a hydrogen and, fuel cell kind he, of yeah, thing? Yeah, and he's in a lot of interviews where he's talking about the invention. You can see compilation clips of him on YouTube quite easily. He, uh, he dies when he's 55 years old, and he's trying to defend people at the Tops Friendly Market. There's an 18-year-old mass shooter. Um, Salter ends up being one of 10 people who are shot to death by this guy. Uh, this guy is a, is a white mass shooter. And according to investigators, his attack was racially motivated. He was aiming to kill black people. So there we see a tragedy that is unfortunately heartbreakingly all too common in the U S but then we also see that one of those 10 victims is a guy who's actively working on a hydrogen fuel cell, a water-powered car. So people start putting the dots together. Is this, uh, Ben, it says here that police say Salter actually had a weapon himself and fired back at the gunman? Yes, he died attempting to defend people. Yeah. Wow. And this was, uh, this was quite recently, too. This mass shooting occurred on May 14th, 2022. Kind of wild, because this guy wasn't like some sort of funded you know, researcher. He was just kind of working on this stuff like as a hobby almost, right? Yeah, he was independent. He was uh, 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 self, self-starting. self This kind of, feels kind of like a thing. coincidence to me. I, I, I don't know if it feels related, mm-hmm. because, especially to your point of the motive of the shooter in the first place. Right, yeah, and we don't want to give the shooter too much air time, but no, that, that no, was no. his motive. You're absolutely right. The The guy's name was Peyton S. Gendron, or Gendron, G-E-N-D-R-O-N, uh, got sentenced last year, uh, actually almost exactly a year ago today, got sentenced to 11 consecutive life sentences, which consecutive means one after the other, so he can't serve them concurrently. He's not getting out. Got it. But I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of with you, uh, with you guys on this one because there's there's a Facebook video from the Facebook account called 19 Keys, number one, number nine Keys, uh, that links Salter's death to his earlier claims of this water powered car invention. And the concept here seems to be that this mass murder might be some sort of elaborate cover story or cover up meant to silence yet another inventor who poses an existential threat to the established energy and transit industries and looking into it. I don't see it. You know, we're not the end all be all arbiters of the truth here, but it feels like again, because of what he was interested in, in his lifetime, in his retirement, that maybe there's, a little bit of red string 
from points that may not actually be connected. And he did oh. he did die defending people. He was a hero. I didn't know he was a former police lieutenant for right. the, yeah. the Buffalo Police De- Department. Yeah. And he was a security guard at the place where the shooting, where, where the shooting took place. Aaron Salter Jr. was a, was a security guard. Yeah. That, that's, that's, I didn't that's realize That's what you're that. saying. Yeah. A, to, a tops friendly market. I yeah. didn't realize he was a security guard, but I don't know why that left my brain as we were talking about it, Ben. I was trying to connect dots here. I missed that. So that was just his side gig or his maybe primary gig and then doing the other thing on the side. Mm-hmm. Retirement. Um, yeah. I don't see how you, I don't see how you target the security guard in a mass shooting like that on purpose, right? If you're, if you're just going to take out the security guard, I don't know why anyone would come up with the plan in any darkened room, no matter how Illuminati you are to, uh, I don't think that's the plan. Right. There are much more efficient ways to try to go through that kind of, that kind of assassination, right? You know, uh, you could target the car, you could target any other weak points. And and it does sound like this guy, from what we know about the mass shooting, the assailant was streaming on Twitch, dude. And he went into the parking lot and opened fire, yelling racial slurs. And so the response here is the response you would have if you were a security guard. It doesn't sound like it just doesn't make sense for that to be the kind of cover story of cover story there is. It sounds like an absolute tragedy, yet again, familiar to American discourse that has nothing to do with the idea of a water-powered car. Is that fair to say? I think so. That's yeah. how I feel. Okay. We have, and you know, if we are incorrect, if there's information we're missing, please let us know for any of these cases, mm-hmm. because survivors, families, and friends still want answers. And often the investigators want answers too. Uh, we, I was, we were thinking we could end with an update from a person that we mentioned previously in Mysterious Inventors Chapter 1. We didn't give the full look at it, but Ning Li... Ning Li is anomalous in these cases. Ning Li, Chinese-American scientist, shook popular media in the West back in the 90s and early 2000s because of her seemingly credible work with anti-gravity. And if you are searching for Dr. Li, you aren't going to find a ton written about. Well, actually, no, you will find a lot written about her on various websites and blogs, but it's tough to come by anything written about her that you might take as, oh, well, this is a credible source, right, that I could cite, and I would feel comfortable with that. Except for one popular mechanics, uh, like, magazine article that you tracked down, Ben. Yeah, we had to uh, go, go through some German sources, but uh, also you, you could see Lee being um, cited, interviewed, examined in popular science magazines of the day, like Discover and Popular Mechanics. And the article we're talking about specifically there, Matt, is Taming Gravity by Jim Wilson. You can see Lee in the center of a photograph at the top uh, with two of her colleagues, Doctors Campbell and Smalley, and what she's holding there in the middle that looks sort of like a bunt cake meets a record player. That is the um, that is the superconductor disc she made uh, or discovered or invented that purportedly purportedly fights against gravity. It's really dope. I mean, if when you when you read about her on those other places, it it. People think that Dr. Ning Lee was on the cusp of something huge when it comes to, what do they call it, Grav- gravitometric fields. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really cool. It's it's straight out of the science fiction novels that we love, right? Somebody has a breakthrough in this science, and now we can actually build that UFO-type craft that we've been trying to make all these years. Um, and... The weird thing is maybe we should, should we go through actually what she found or should we just talk about her, her quote disappearance? Oh, let's sum it up real quick. Okay. okay yeah. So like nine, 1990s, 2000s, she is not just appearing in popular science magazines. She's doing science. She co-authors a number of uh, papers um, published in these various journals that are arguing 
the discovery of a practicable method of fighting gravity. And what what she says, or what the theory is, is that you can, <laughs> this is deep water, we'll keep it brief, you can rotate ions through a gravitometric field perpendicular, so at an angle, to their natural spin, and this will nullify some of the effects of gravity. So to break it down by analogy, we could say she figured out that you can push ions in a different way that will change the direction in which gravity pushes. So you're just kind of like leveraging the force differently. Possible? She thought so. And a lot of her peers did. Uh, and then it seemed like she was on to something. Uh, she was working at the University of Alabama for a while. She left. She created a limited liability corporation called AC Gravity, which is active today. Found that. Like any good company, they're based in De Delaware for tax purposes. Of course. But the lab's in Huntsville, Alabama, if you ever yeah. wanted to check it out. Um, so th she, there was a grant, right? There's, a, there's quite a bit of money that was given to this organization that she started to check and see if there's any sand here. Uh, could we do that? That sounds great. Uh, amazing. Talk about something that would go straight to, you know, one of the big defense contractors if this technology existed. Um, if it's not already there dun, 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 dun. in 1999. Um, but the grant, well, how much was the grant for? It was under $500,000. So big to individuals at the time, but chump changed uncle Sam. Oh, we got the actual number. Yeah. It's $448,970. I don't know why they couldn't spring for the extra 30 bucks. Hmm. I, I think it was actually for four hundred thousand dollars, but that forty eight nine seventy was like a salary that somebody got for a year. I think that's oh. what it was. No, I'm just joking. I don't know. Quite don't know. possibly, <laughs> it is a specific number. We know the grant went from so again in two thousand one, like you're saying, and it ends in two thousand and two. What did they do with all that money? We will never know. No. Do never, uh, never know. Dr. Lee kind of disappeared. You you can find several videos of her speaking at various places for various functions, talking about the potentials of her research and the science that she and her team are doing. And then all of a sudden, boop, she's gone. Uh, but there is something that occurred that I was not aware of last time we were recording this uh, the first episode, Ben. Um, and that's something that happened to her in her personal life. Yeah. So... In 2014, she is still like she's left the University of Alabama, but still definitely has connections. And the lab is in Huntsville. She is walking down the street in the University of Alabama campus when she is struck by a vehicle. Her spouse is nearby. Her spouse sees the accident and is so terrified that he suffers a heart attack, permanently damages him. He passes away uh, just a year later as a result. Dr. Lee does not die immediately. She suffers uh, what some have called a fate worse than death. She has lasting, significant brain damage, which quite likely led to her contracting Alzheimer's. Yes. And there is, you can go online, you can find an obituary for a Dr. Ning Lee. Um, and it states that she was born January 14th, 1943. And that she passed away on July 27th, 2021. Um, I, ben, I, I was unable to verify if this is in fact a real obituary for the actual Dr. Ning Lee that we're talking about. But it certainly does seem like that. At the top, it describes her as a 79 years old and, quote, one of the world's leading scientists in superconductivity and anti-gravity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... It is unfortunately this person's obituary, as far as I can tell as well. She um, she passed away. We don't know how far uh, this scientist anti-gravity research actually went. We don't know why the DOD threw 500 grand at it. We don't, we don't know what would have happened. We don't, you know, and also to be clear, we're saying we don't know. We're not trying to necessarily imply there was some huge overarching cover-up, but we can say the information's just not out there. I mean, 
Also, people just get hit by cars all the time. It's true. It's very true. Uh, one thing we would say is like the whole falling out of windows thing, an accidental death is a likely choice for someone who is a professional looking to obfu- uh, to hide that um, a hit is occurring. Just putting that out there doesn't mean Dr. Lee's death had anything to do with that. It is just, it is a, I would say a likely way to go about killing someone you want dead. If you're an organization that's a little more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. If you're, yeah. And there's also, you know, there's the fact that if this person had not encountered this tragedy, they would have lived just fine through the, the span of their natural life. And uh, the research that they did could have still been kept secret. So we don't know. Yeah. there's also the possibility that the DOD ponied up the money, which is chump change for them. That's just a few pony bones for Uncle Sam. And then, <laughs> thank you, that's for you. And then they looked into it and they said, oh, this actually isn't um, either applicable or it isn't, you know, there's some error in, in the methodology or something. Like the, what is it, the story of the EM drive. Remember that from a few years back that garnered a similar level of interest and we haven't heard much about it since makes you think I just, I I feel like this is, this just goes to show that that scratching the surface. It tells us a lot about human psychology and the, the need to see patterns, but we also still have a lot of unanswered questions. How much of this is sheer accident, terrible luck, how much of it might be the result of the stuff they don't want you to know. I, we would highly recommend you read that uh, that article in Popular Mechanics that Ben found. Yes. Oh, the 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 article itself is in English. Yeah. It's just easier to find in German. Yeah. Which also makes you think, does it not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nine? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Nine indeed. <laughs> uh, maybe we call it a day here uh, because the next part of this The next part of this exploration depends on you, constant listeners, fellow conspiracy realists. Let us know if any of these cases are familiar to you. Let us know if you have new information. Let us know if there are, whether there are other inventors or scientists you want us to look into. Can't wait to hear from you. We try to be easy to find online. Correcto Mundo. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff, where we exist on Facebook, where we have our Facebook group. Here's where it gets crazy. We are also Conspiracy Stuff Show on YouTube, where we have weekly video delights rolling out for your viewing pleasure, as well as on X, FKA Twitter. On Instagram and TikTok, we are Conspiracy Stuff Show. Yes, yes, yes. We also have a phone number. But guys, I'm going to put one last quote in here from that popular mechanics article because I missed it while we were going through this. This is a quote from Dr. Ning Li when asked about why she continues to turn down money from investors. Quote, investors want control over the technology. This is too important. It should belong to all the American people. Oh, wow. No, yeah, she was murdered then. (laughs) (laughs) Kidding, kidding. I just mean that, in my opinion, that sentiment is dangerous. Because Mm. there are people who do want to control it, who maybe even already control something like it and don't want anyone else to have it. Just putting it out there. Hey, we've got a phone number. It's 1-833-STD-WYTK. When you call in, you've got three minutes. Give yourself a cool nickname and let us know if we can use your name and message on the air. If you don't want to do that, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We can't emphasize the importance of the email, folks. We read every single one we get. A shout out to Trent, uh, who introduces us to the importance of pronunciation, saying, I wanted to address the pronunciation of Guy Anna and Esequibo. Uh, talking about our Venezuela Guiana episode or Guyana episode, you pronounce them like most people would and do, but neither are Spanish words. And pronouncing them in a Spanish sounding way only helps give credence to Venezuela's claims. Guyana is pronounced like Diana. Esequibo is pronounced with the Q U I like in quit. It's an Amerindian word, and although it looks Spanish, it is not pronounced that way. Thank you so much, Trent. You are absolutely correct about the pronunciation. Uh, please, please, please send us any and all messages you feel your fellow conspiracy realist 
should know. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.